studies of water quality in distribution systems, all of the data that I've collected points to cleaning the water mains aids in improving water quality in the distribution system. And that in includes helping to get in compliance with the lead and copper rule, with disinfection byproducts, with the total coliform rule, and on and on. All of our ills in the distribution system come from neglected water mains. I sh maybe I shouldn't use the word neglected. It, it's that it's in our field, we haven't put enough importance on cleaning and replacing pipes. I have up here two publications that I've written, this Water Research Foundation report. It's available free to download. It pretty much pulls together all of my experiences of gathering this data in many water systems and showing that, that a clean water system aids in improving water quality. I've got a second edition of my monitoring book coming out in January, and it's now a very step-by-step -step process that uh, any size water utility can work with. I just want to go through this very briefly as to why cleaning the system helps water quality. The reason is that we've got drinking water that comes from nature and it's got all kinds of chemicals in it and not only that it's got a potpourri of microorganisms because microorganisms are everywhere in the environment when it comes into the water pipe it has interactions with chemical scales and biofilms that have built up over time every pipe in every water system has some degree of chemical scales that have uh, fallen out onto the pipe wall and microorganisms have glued them together with their biofilms. So that's what our water comes in contact with. And it's a very complicated process. We've got all kinds of chemical interactions and microbiological interactions happening. And the micro microbiology actually participates in the chemistry. So everything's tied together in a very complicated way. And the result is we get all of our problems in water quality that we have regulations for and some that we don't even have regulations for. When you look at the regulatory perspective, they try to treat each one of these distribution system problems separately and so here's an example of the lead and copper rule. They greatly simplify the problem and idealize it. Instead of that whole big list of chemicals and microorganisms, the lead and copper rule says you've only got compounds of carbon that's coming in the water. And in the, in the pipe, there's only carbonates of lead and copper sitting on the pipe wall. And the result is the more soluble lead and copper carbonates come out in the water and the insoluble ones stay on the pipe wall. And you can see that that is greatly simplified from what we initially said is actually out in the distribution system. So with our, our regulations for the lead and copper rule, they say, well, just adjust pH and alkalinity and then that adjusts how much of the carbonates are soluble, and you can lower the lead and copper that way. Or you can add orthophosphate, and that does make a less soluble compound with lead and copper, and there's less release of lead and copper in the water itself. However, that's all very ideal, and it's not the reality of our water systems. So using the comprehensive perspective that I talked about You've got to physically clean out these chemical scales and biofilms. You've got, there's another step you have to do, and that's tr take steps to prevent microorganisms from growing excessively. But we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about let's just clean out the chemical scales and biofilms. And that's exactly what Green Bay did. And they had a lot of success in coming back into compliance 
with the lead and copper rule and then there's other aspects of water quality that are being solved by doing this cleaning. So I'm going to turn this over to Justin and Brian in Green Bay. I've given them a list of questions to try to answer, but we'll have plenty of time for people to ask questions as well. Well, I'm going to talk for a minute or two, and then I'm going to turn it over to Justin, who's going to do a, uh, if you go through the PowerPoint presentation, but I'll just go through a little bit of the background of uh, how we got to where we're at. You know, we, we started unidirectional flushing in 2014 as a means of our uh, corrosion uh, control for the lead and copper rule. So we did half of our system in 2014. We did the rest of our system in 2015. And then we took a year off. And then in 2017, we did half of our system again. So that's what we're going to keep doing is about half of our system a year, uh, at least in the foreseeable future. But we are a few facts about that. We, we flushed almost 440 miles of water main is what our whole distribution system is comprised of. So if you take that in half, we're doing about 220 miles a year, roughly, with one crew to give you guys a little perspective as Justin's going through his PowerPoint presentation. And that basically comes down to roughly uh, 2,200 flushing sequences and a little over 1,000 feet per sequence is what we're flushing at a crack. Uh, so if you guys keep that in mind as we're going through, and then I'll turn it over to Justin. And like I so said, this is going to be a pretty informal presentation, so you guys can hop in at any time with questions and, uh, or information or whatever you've got. We'll be more than glad to answer whatever as we're going. You don't have to wait till the end. Yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of buzz through some parts of this. Um, I, had to, I gave this down in the Dells of the distribution conference, so some of you may have seen parts of this already. I'm not sure. Um, I did tweak it a bit, but some parts I'll breeze through and some I'll elaborate on. But essentially, we'll give a little background like Brian already did. Um, I'll explain a bit why we did it, which he's done already, um, how we created our program, and how we prepped to do it, how we actually did it, and then go through a little bit of the findings and results, and then we can do some question and answer. But by all means, you know, jump in if you have questions as I go. So just some quick stats on us. We have about 36 and a half thousand customers, about 18 million gallons a day. It's our average day, our max in 2016 was about 27 and a half million gallons a day. Uh, our system's rated at about 42 million, so we have capacity left here yet. But uh, as far as our pipe type, um, up to 64, predominantly cast iron was installed. 65 to 72, um, unprotected ductile was put in. Uh, between 73 and 03, it was bag ductile, and since then, PVC was our predominant pipe type. The uh, vast majority of our breaks occur on our cast iron and unbagged ductile. So I don't know any of you have previous history with unidirectional flushing, but I'll quickly go through what it is. Um, you'll hear the term UDF a lot, obviously unidirectional flushing. It's a systematic approach to change the flow pattern you see here on the left, this hydrant, if you were to open it up, you're pulling from four directions. For unidirectional flushing, you would close these three valves to create dead ends, essentially, and pull when you open that hydrant just from one direction, hence the term uni one direction. Uh, that results in higher flushing velocities. Um, this water main here, you know, it is not used to seeing the velocity that it sees once it's valved down to be the only feed to that hydrant. Uh, so what may be in your system, this picture here is not ours. I pulled that off the internet, but I wouldn't doubt if we were to cut into some of our pipes, some of them might look like that. Hopefully not as bad anymore, um, but that's likely what you might see. This, uh, this is some chunks that we've gotten out. Um, that's just a small sample we've seen bigger. To give you an example of what's in a water main, I guess, if you were to look at these bottles here, you can see the water is gin clear. These were sitting on the desk for a while. Now picture your water main with normal flow and that material settle out in the bottom. This is that same bottle after giving it a quick shake. And you can see how quickly a little bit of sediment in the bottom clouds up that pipe. Some perceived headaches we 
our crews, some of us had in mind and what actually happened. We heard we're going to have plug meters all over town from customer service, discolored water complaints. Distribution is worried about water breaks due to, you know, creating dead ends all over the place on old pipes, opening hydrants, operating valves. We we're expecting a lot of breaks. Between 14, 15, and 2017, we've literally done about 3,400 different flushes now. And we've had a handful of plug meters, um, nothing dramatic, but we have had some. We've had a, some diswatered, discolored water calls, but not a ton either. Um, 24, put it this way, in, in 14 and 15, we bought red out. I don't know if familiar are with that. We are bought it in case people called about discolored laundry. Um, we could give them a bottle of red out to help get the iron stains out, and we did not have to give one bottle out. Uh, broken water mains are concerned about that. We somewhat tracked it. This isn't exactly precise, but I'm comfortable saying we had a break on less than 2% of our flushing sequences. So if you do the math, you know, you're looking 60 to 70 breaks out of 3,500 flushes. And some of that was at the initial start in 2014 before we found a few ways that there's no way to quantify that it helped, but we suspect it helped prevent a lot of breaks. And I'll go through that as we go as well. Yeah, if I can cut in for one quick second, something to keep in mind for you guys. We were on well water until 1957. And then from 1957 to the present, we were on Lake Michigan water. Just to keep in perspective, because obviously well systems are going to have a lot more tuberculation and, and buildup than, than lake water is experiencing. But we did have quite a bit of our system put in prior to 57, and we had never unidirectional flush before or done a real extensive flushing program. So this was the first real flushing program that we implemented. So we still had some stuff from the uh, pre-1957 in our water main. And then the other thing is the unidirectional flushing is we – you're flushing at a minimum of five feet per second to scour the mains. And I'll turn it back over to Justin with that. Yep. So why did we decide to do a UDF project? Uh, Abigail and Brian have already hit on it a lot already. Uh, just the, we've heard other communities across the country that have done it at a drop in iron and turbidity levels, improved, improved chlorine residuals, improved C factors, fire flows, so our goals that we set was just to give our distribution system a thorough cleaning. And what Brian was alluding to, we were on well water. Uh, a lot more minerals uh, with that. Give that a good cleaning in areas that predominantly were on well water for most of their life. Um, reduce biofilm, tuberculation, and par particulates, which when Abigail's world get us below some action level. Improve C factors, which would help hydraulic capacity fire flows improve overall efficiency and water quality, and then use this as an opportunity to compare modeled information versus what we actually found when we did the flushing. I'll get into that a little bit here, but uh, to do this without a, a hydraulic model, it would be difficult, I think. Um, so we'll touch on that a little bit. But ours was created with a consultant, AECOM. Um, Depending on where you're at, they may have bought out other companies that you may be more familiar with. It used to be called STS Consultants in Green Bay. They're a large company, and uh, I was, to be honest, worked hand in hand with them quite a bit through the first year, anyways. Very responsive, very helpful. Um, did a good job. So we gave them our system information size of mains, valves, GIS, maps, et cetera. Uh, they then created a hydraulic model did some calibration where they took some telogs across the city to, I guess, model the pressure to see if it was accurate and basically calibrated a, an actual model of our system. So if we were to close valves, open hydrants, they in their software would be able to tell, you know, how it was uh, going to affect and provide real world data that we could then verify with our flushing. We had to create some guidelines for our unidirectional flushing. Um, one was, when do we stop the flush? The level we decided upon was one NTU. So I don't know how many of you have done flushing. If you were to take a little sample vial, and I'll have some examples coming up, of water, and you hold it up against a white sheet of paper, some communities do it that way when they're doing their flushing. You may not even be close to one. It might look pretty clear to you, but it's surprising 
how long it takes. I shouldn't say how long it takes. It's surprising how much flushing you have to do, I guess, to get down to one. A lot of our hangups where you get down to about three NTU, and then the, the long wait, the longer wait would come between three NTU and one versus whatever you started at the three, if that makes any sense. It clears up quick, but then takes a while to get down to one. Brian just mentioned uh, five feet per second. That was our goal to get five feet, feet per second of movement through our pipe. Um, people smarter than me decided that would be the magic number to create a scour effect, to bust circulation loose by biofilm and give the pipe a scour. And then the amount of time dedicated to do the program. Um, in our first year, <clears throat> between getting things set up and running, getting the sheets made, and then all the other stuff you don't think about that I'll touch on here, getting communication out to your businesses in town, your residents, uh, co coordinating with other departments. Uh, our first year, we started the first week of May and ended November 1st. Um, I was out in the field doing this daily. Um, towards the end, to get done by November 1st, we were doing 60-hour weeks just to get caught up. So we learned from that, and in subsequent years, we try to start around April 1st. For example, this year, we, what we, were, we flushed this year again what we did in 14. Uh, in 14, we started the week of May 1st, end of November 1st. This year, we started the first week of April, and we finished last Monday. Um, so you got to plan ahead. It's not something you can start, stop, quit for a week, come back to it. Once you start, you got to keep the ball rolling. Uh, meetings, discussions, you got to troubleshoot and coordinate. Think of every situation that might come up. Uh, we can help with that. We've been through this a few years now. And once all pieces are gathered, you can create the flushing sequences. This map, everyone's different. I get that. But this is just a quick map of our system. Um, in 2014 and this year, we flushed our largest pressure zone, John Street, which is downtown Green Bay, the oldest part of the city. Uh, that section has a lot of six inch old water main in it. And of course, since it's older, it took a little longer for flushing. Um, because we got the earlier start and expected better results in 2014, we did John Street. This year, we did John Street and our 7th Street zone and are able to finish both of those in a little less time than what it would have taken doing them initially at the same time in earlier years. So our program in general, Brian alluded to this earlier, we had, it took about 2,200 flushes to do the entire city. It was about 436 miles, give or take, a water main. Our average gallons per flush, that's the question we get. Um, our average was 27,500 gallons of flush. And to do our entire city over the two years, it took just about 60 million gallons of water. Yeah, and the other quick thing I... <clears throat> might be ahead is our, our average flush for the whole city is about 23 minutes per flush once we fire it up and open up the hydrant. And I know you, if you talk to some well communities, you'll hear how flushes would take, some of them are five, six hours. And we did run into some flushes that were hours long, but overall the, the average was 23 minutes per flush. Right. I, on, the, on the residential eight inch main, you know, you might be there five, 10 minutes where if you get an older six inch pipe where you just can't get the velocity to flow through, but you might sit there an hour, hour and a half. Um, we've had flushes that took four or five minutes and that was more just to get the hydrant up and flowing. By the time we had our initial turbidity test done, took our second sample, it was already below one on a newer PVC main. Um, our longest flush was five and a half hours and that was on a river crossing that went under the Fox River here in town. It was several thousand feet long. What type pipe is that? 24? 24. I think it was a 24 inch main. Um, that took a while to clean out because we had a belly, you know, a below, going below a river that over time had never been flushed. Sediment built up, built up and just takes a while to turn that water over. Some quick stats for you. Um, you can see our chart here is, for instance, John Street Zone. Literally, it, we turned by hand 1,800 valves to do the John Street Zone. Um, if you're tracking your valves for, to report to the DNR for valves exercise, we could report 1,439 of those. You're probably wondering why they're different. You'll see it coming up on a future slide here. 
some of the valves you turn, you're going to be turning multiple times to create dead ends. You know, if you have a, a, a cross intersection with a hydrant at it and you've got to flush each of the four streets out of that one hydrant, you basically have four flushes to turn valves for. You're going to be using some of the same valves over. It's uh, not new valves every time you flush, so to speak. And that also would be why the hydrant exercise versus hydrants operated is different. Uh, we flushed out of 1,325 hydrants, but could only report 831 individual hydrants. Yeah, and give you guys a little bit, just so you know, like probably pro proportional wise to your system, we exercised the total, you can see that last column, of 2,400 hydrants. We have about 4,000 total hydrants in our system. So we actually operated over half of our hydrants to do this unidirectional flushing program in the valves exercise you know there's roughly 2800 we have about a little less than 10,000 valves in our system valves total so you know maybe about a third of our valves are exercised and well over half of our hydrants in order to do this so once our program is created that's great but now what um, one thing that came up obviously is notifying businesses and residents about this because their flow pattern might change they'll see some pressure fluctuations depending on where you're at and how your system set up. So we sent a letter and we learned from this in 2015 and this year. In 14, we sent a letter out to businesses, but it went to the billing department like our water bill would. Well, what we learned was that's not the best way to do it because the billing department either tossed it out or didn't funnel it to the right person. So there were businesses that were water sensitive and unless you have a smaller city to know what businesses are water sensitive, I mean, you have a, a general idea, but so just so we found out some businesses that were water sensitive that we did not prepare for. So we learned from that and made sure on our letters we put attention facilities director. And this year we even went a step further and put that right on the envelope. And we, instead of sending it to the billing address, we literally sent the mailing to the service address. So there were businesses in town where they might have a bathroom and a warehouse and no office. That business got a letter sent to it. It just got bounced back to us as undeliverable. Um, if no one was there to get it or they didn't have a mailbox. But it was just part of, I guess, doing business. We knew we'd have some of them bounce back to us. But we felt it was a better way to notify people. Uh, residents, we notified via postcard. I'll have an example of that coming up. We also used our website, uh, Facebook, we notified other city departments, DPW, uh, fire, et cetera. And then we created a call list for residents and businesses who needed uh, to be called before we flushed. <clears throat> we then designated staff who keep that list up to date. And a suggestion I would have in your notifications, direct them to your website. A lot of the questions can be answered there if you set it up right. We had uh, weekly progress maps posted so people could see where we're at and kind of get a timeline of when we'll be by them and that saved our staff time. Here's the uh, postcard we sent to all the residents. You can see the front um, kind of kept the text to a minimum and then on the back gave them more information with their phone number at the bottom. Uh, what we were accomplishing with this was just to let people know, hey, we're coming to do some flushing, but it also gave people who might be water sensitive doing an in-home daycare or someone on dialysis a heads up that we're coming and then a chance to give us a call and get put on our call list. Yeah, if I can jump in quick on this, uh, you guys might be thinking, holy cow, there's a lot of people that would be calling and you have this big long list to contact. We had probably about 120 people call us up and want to get put on that list. And uh, so it's not really daunting over that 220 miles. We had 120 different uh, businesses. But the one thing I'll say is if you know the businesses ahead of time that are definitely water sensitive, like the hospitals or a, a real large user, a lot of them never responded back to us. So we knew that we had to contact them on our own. So the critical customers, we, we went ahead and contacted regardless. But don't be surprised if what you consider critical, they're not getting back to you. Right. There were a lot of assumptions made, I think, by businesses that we would just contact them. So. Uh, um, we also then made, had these signs made up on sandwich boards and then would put them out every morning and pick them up every evening so they didn't get ripped off. But on arterial streets or the collector streets coming into the neighborhood we were flushing, 
And if you notice, these signs look a lot like our postcard we sent out. That was intentional. The, you know, we sent this postcard out at the start. It might be a few months before we get by people. So we're hoping by seeing this sign, it would remind them, oh, yeah, that was that postcard I got. They're coming close to flushing. This is just an example of a call list that we had for 2015. might be hard to see um, that there's a school, a beauty salon, a restaurant, a dentist office, and a business. Just this is one stretch on a commercial area where we had five, five phone calls to make. So it's not overly daunting every day, but it's still something to keep in mind and plan for. Equipment we used, obviously you're familiar with diffusers, um, gate valves, I'll explain a little bit more why we use those um, on our hydrants between the diffuser and the hydrant steamer nozzle. Pitot tubes, need that to determine how many gallons per minute you're flushing. Gauges, we were shocked at how many gauges we used, um, but I guess these gauges, you know, it didn't matter. We tried higher quality, more expensive gauges and El Chico gauges. They lasted about the same. I don't think they're just made for the continued start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. And then with your initial turbidity, you're stirring up sediment. Sediment might be blowing up into those and giving you false readings. So something to keep in mind, I have a lot of those in stock. A turbidimeter over here on the left, we'll measure water turbidity, chlorometer for chlorine residual. Have a lot of test bottles. Uh, Monday morning after a long weekend, you're going to lose sample bottles. That hydrant will blow them right out of your hand if you're not ready for it. Um, tarps. Something to think about when you're setting up your diffusers, where are you aiming it? Which way does the road uh, drain? Because you might be sitting there five minutes. You might be sitting there over an hour. You don't know until you start that hydrant up and see where your turbidity is at. Um, we used old traffic signs as a helpful one, and we pinned everything down with, if you're familiar with the survey world, some old chaining pins. You can still buy these, and we just pounded them down through the tarp, pushed them in, whatever, and it held everything in place. If we didn't use tarps, I don't know how much topsoil and seed we would have went through trying to fix everything. Um, another little tidbit I would suggest, um, hydrant surge relief, or kunkel valves, some people call them. This is just a video of right now I'm flowing the hydrant while the other guy helping me was videoing this. So while I shut the hydrant down, there's uh that that was set at system pressure. Okay, so when I shut that hydrant down, that's the initial surge of that pipe filling back up. And we're suspecting that piece of equipment saved us on a lot of water breaks. Because we did have water breaks the first couple months of this program before we started using these. And again, I mentioned earlier, we have no way to quantify it, but I suspect these uh, little devices did save us quite a few water main breaks and repairs. And in traffic control, you're going to be flooding streets, you know, so plan ahead. Radios, uh, communications key, obviously, you got to be able to talk to everyone. Someone's going to be sitting by a hydrant a block away watching a static gauge. You're not going to be able to communicate without radios. And in cases of paint, You'll see why in a few minutes. Staffing needs is a question I'm sure you guys will be asking about. Our typical day, um, and it depends on the number of valves you have to turn, how many hydrants you're going to be flushing, and what your staff is capable of, how, how familiar they are with the system. Um, I would suggest not hiring summer interns and just cutting them loose. Uh, that will not go well. You're going to need someone with a little bit of experience. Our typical day was a two-person crew essentially a crew leader and an assistant. Um, we, a three-person crew is not unusual. Um, if you have a, a, some guys who might be a little slower turning valves, you might want to have a third guy helping. Uh, we did have four or more on occasion. Depending on the number of hydrants, you'll be flushing. The larger the water main, the more water you got to get through it, meaning the more hydrants you got to open. Some of our um, flushes, like a 24-inch river crossing that went for over five hours, we had five hydrants wide open. That required about eight people because I was also on Broadway in Green Bay, which is a major road, so we needed a couple guys with slow paddles and a person manning each hydrant, and then we just had a floater bouncing around, you know, where the flooding, where the inlets couldn't keep up to have people slow down. You got to have your other staff aware, you know, if you have a pumping section or someone in charge of wells, make sure they know what's going on in case the, you know, your SCADA system starts showing low pressure in spots or a jump in water usage, at least they know what's going on. 
office staff for calls. Um, you will have residents, even though they got a postcard, they'll forget. They'll call up and say, hey, I'm having reduced pressure. What's going on? So, you know, something to keep in mind. Um, a couple suggestions I have when you do this, keep your crew assignments consistent as possible. They will literally start mapping as it's been there, done that. You will draw a map in your head of what valves are open and what are closed. And I'll go over a good way to track that coming up here. But just having that familiarity is huge versus new people on this. You can't, I would highly recommend you don't pick and choose and swap people daily or anything. I mean, after, you know, a week or two at a time, so they learn the process would be fine, but try to keep it consistent. And assign a vehicle to each crew member. That's huge, because there's going to be valves to turn, diffusers to set up. If you send two guys out with one truck, they literally have to either drop a guy off so he can put on a diffuser while the other guy turns all the valves, or vice versa. It just would be way more time consuming. So your pre-planning is done, field work begins. Uh, what we did anyways was a crew leader would print out the worksheets, his flushing sequence sheets every day. He'd check the call list and make calls, giving people their notice. He would uh, figure out where to put static gauges on hydrants to monitor system pressure during the flush and also kind of look at leak report history and just if they have a good knowledge of the system, know where to put those surge relief valves to help prevent water main breaks in the area you're flushing. They would operate the flushing hydrant and then run the turbidity test, chlorine residuals, and complete the sequence paperwork. And then they'd look ahead and plan for the next day and make calls if needed. The other members would set out those notification A-frame sandwich signs every morning. They would predominantly turn the valves, set up static gauges on hydrants. They'd set up the conkle or surge relief valves. And then if there's time, if the flush is running long and you have extra diffusers, they would actually go ahead and get the diffuser placed on the next hydrant. They wouldn't start the hydrant, but they just get ready for the next flush just to help streamline it. Um, and then if there were more than one hydrant, they would operate the additional hydrants as well. And they'd help with traffic control. One thing you'll see here is inlet grate cleaning. The reason we wanted to start as early in the year as possible is if you look out your window right now, you can probably see it. There's leaves everywhere. A lot of residents sleep there, or at least by us, rake their leaves right out into the street, which plugs all the inlets, which results in road flooding. So we tried to start earlier to avoid fall leaf pickup. Pre-check valves. If you have a valve turning program, it should be very helpful. If you don't, you're going to need to check your valves out ahead of time. Um, we have a pretty good GIS system here where we know where our valves are. Um, if we know they're not paved over because they're a valve turning program that they're exercised every few years. So we felt comfortable with what we have. You might be in a different boat. Um, at the end of the day, they would, that crew would take down the notification signs and essentially this process would just get repeated the next day and the next day until all the flushing for the year was done. Yeah, if I can jump in real quick. Let's touch on that a little bit because I know I was kind of a concern with the uh, with the valve turning and hydrant operating. Is we have a, uh, a fairly good hydrant operating program. We get to every hydrant in our system basically within two years. So every hydrant is operated, greased. You know, we make sure it works. So that way, we were very confident in our hydrants, our valves, where we were getting to them. Well, they're on about a five-year rotation, but it's a continual rotation. So we had been to every valve numerous times over the last 10, 15 years. So when we were out in the field, correct me wrong, Jessica, because you were out there, we probably, each year we may have ran into a handful or two valves at the most that were either broken, open, broken, closed, whatever, that we had to actually get fixed in order to continue the flushing. Sometimes we're able to ad-lib in a, turn some other valves to make it work. And there was a few times we actually had to stop in order to uh, get something fixed. But it was very minimal because we had been doing a valve operating program. And like just so we knew where they all were and we've been operating them. So we, we ran into very few problems that way. So here's an example of a map that AECOM produced for us. For There's one of these maps for every flush. And I'll quickly go through it here. Um, you can see there's a key down here in the legend, and it's essentially the blue lines are water main we have not flushed yet up to this point. 
Um, orange lines are water main we have flushed um, up to this particular sequence. And then on this flush, this green line is the sequence or uh, the section of main we're going to be scouring and cleaning under this flush. <clears throat> One thing to keep in mind with UDF, uh, I wouldn't say a general rule of thumb, it's the golden rule. You always pull from what we call clean water, not dirty water, if you want to look at it that way. We always you always are pulling from the orange lines. If you see this flush, this red hydrant is the hydrant we're flushing out, and we're pulling from this orange line, which has been previously flushed. Um, that way, you know, the water you're pulling from has already been down to one NTU. You shouldn't be pulling from any of these blue lines, which haven't been flushed yet, and you're going to be sitting there for quite a while to get it. Um, you might be hard to see. I'm on a projection screen here, but if you're at a computer, you can see it better, I think. You'll see some valve numbers in orange, and in an orange little circle with an X, that's a symbol for a valve that needs to be closed in order to do this flush. Um, just the opposite here, this green one is a valve that has to be opened in order to do this flush. It was closed on a previous sequence, which are these blue valves, valves that are still closed while this flush is taking place. Um, if you see this chart over here, I think there's like 38 valves in our system at, during this flush that are previously closed. You won't reopen every valve after you're done with the flush. Some of them stay closed. It all depends on how your consultant designs your uh, flushing program. What you're trying to create is a dead end, essentially. You're trying to create a dead end for this main, so the only way water can get to this hydrant is through this green line. That's accomplished here by this closed valve, this closed valve. You have a closed valve up here and a closed valve back here. So what's going to happen when this flush starts up, the only water the people behind this hydrant, so to speak, are going to get or whatever is whatever water gets past your hydrant during that flush. So, you know, these, this block and this block are going to see a reduced pressure while the flush takes place. This is a, the worksheet that goes with this map. Uh, bad example. This is, yeah, it might be, it is the same one. Okay. It tells you here the action item, open a valve, close a valve, close a valve, and then you flush. And you do them in that order. If you, you have to open your opens before you close your closes. That's a rule to live by on this. If we were to, you know, go and uh, close these valves before we open this one, we're shutting people out of water completely because you'll have, you know, if you go back to this map, if you close these valves before you open this valve, there's no feed to this main until that valve is open. So always open before you close. And this is what we would do. We'd print it out and put it in a binder so the map was above the worksheet so you could kind of correlate, look up and down and see what was going on. That worked pretty well. I mentioned earlier tracking the valves in case you're thinking, how in the heck are we going to remember where all these closed valves are? Well, one of the guys in our office here came up with this idea and I thought it was brilliant. Anytime we close the valve, we painted it fluorescent pink. Um, it's extremely helpful. It was great for troubleshooting because, yes, we are human. You're going to forget to open a valve here and there. Um, you might have a valve closed. You'll fire up your hydrant, and you have half the water you were supposed to have, um, and you might be trying to figure out why. Well, a lot of times it'll be because there was a valve closed that someone missed and didn't open. Or if you have multiple people doing valves, you know, if you have 12, 13 valves on a flush, you could easily miss one. Um, all staff benefit from this, especially for on-call personnel that aren't related to the project at all. If it's a Saturday night and they have a main break in the area you're flushing, they can quickly, you know, drive to the other end of the block. And if they see that valve pink, they already know that valve is closed. And then they have to, you know, make some kind of adjustment in the field to do what they have to do. But if you don't have your closed valves painted pink, you're in for a, a long a long program. And once we're done and the valve is open, we paint it blue again. Uh, which diffuser to use? At least on our sequence sheets, from AECOM, it's through, through the system model, they have a estimated total flow. On this particular flush, they're estimating we'll have about 550 gallons per minute, which will get us about 6.5 feet of, per second for our scour. Me seeing that, I'm going to use a two and a half inch diffuser on uh, off the side of our hydrant, not the steamer nozzle. That way, um, with that smaller diffuser, 
you get a better pedo reading and you can more accurately measure how many gallons per minute you're getting. Um, in con contrast, some of our hydrants have four and a half inch steamer nozzles. Some have three and a half inch steamer nozzles. You base the diffuser size off of the line on your worksheet of estimated gallons per minute. Gate valves, this is where I'll talk about these. You might be wondering why in the heck are we slapping these on with every diffuser? Uh, personally, I had it happen to me in year one before we started using these. You'd open a hydrant, and you've all probably experienced it if you've done it. You can tell the hydrant's freewheeling. It's opening way too easy, and all of a sudden you'll feel the ground pop, and you'll feel that pop, you know, with the hydrant releasing. Uh, we had water breaks happen because of that when that popped. You look down the street a little bit later, and you can see the water coming out. So what we ended up doing or buying these gate valves, um, closing them, loading the hydrant, and then by using that gate valve, we could control um, how fast, essentially, we let the water out of that hydrant. We could control it a lot better, put it that way. Hey, Justin? Yes. Quick question on that. Yeah. I didn't really understand. Are you saying that you had a problem with the actual hydrant valve not opening while you were spinning the, the the wrench there or right and some of our older you know we have hydrants that are 60 70 80 years old in the system you know so when you would up turn the hydrant with the wrench you could just tell this is turning way too easy it's it's freewheeling is what we would call it and the seat wasn't releasing in the hydrant bottom if you're following me yep and then once we had it loose and the water pressure against that hydrant pushed that seat and popped it open you had a little water hammer effect you know which would reverberate through the mains and pop a main. It happened. So what we would do is put that gate valve on, close it, load the hydrant, and if it was freewheeling, we'd yeah, okay. work it back and forth till the hydrant came oh, and started filling. And then we could use the water, that gate valve to slowly open the hydrant, if you're yeah. following me, and let water out the diffuser. Okay. It's just eliminated hydrant pop is what we were calling them. Sure. That help Thanks. explain that a little better for you? That's what I thought it was. It just wasn't real clear. Yep. And then protect the surrounding areas unless you want to use topsoil and 15 yards nonstop and getting complaints. Plan ahead, put tarps out. Uh, here's an example of you know how we would do it. This also helps with uh, street flooding. You weren't blowing these hydrants out into live traffic. Um, you're going to get tuberculation coming out of here, which are essentially dime to, depending on your diffuser and how it, it, it's made. Um, you're going to have chunks up to an inch, inch and a half that may come flying out of here, essentially a rock. You don't want to be shooting that out into traffic. Pedo readings, this is how, you know, you measure your gallons per minute. Um, we had a little cheat sheet here. So we had to fill that out and for every flush. Velocity, pressure, basically the pedo reading, get the gallons per minute fill it in here and uh, it's part of the process. One thing to keep in mind, you're going to need pedo tubes. Here's a new one on the right and a used one on the left. That is bent and it looks like it's been through a sandblaster. Turbidometers, I'm sure you probably are familiar with them. Um, just to help kind of gauge this particular sample bottle here with all the rest, rust Iron flakes in it had a turbidity of 132. Uh, we did have some that pegged the turbidimeter at 1,000. And I'll have video one coming up. For our worksheet, everyone could be different depending on who does them for you, but the highlighted areas are all we had to complete for each flush. The date, what size um, hydrant outlet or nozzle you're using. And then down here, you got to start a flush, end of flush time, minutes the flush took, um, your static reading at an adjacent hydrant, your uh, static, your residual, and the here. Nozzle size, your pedo reading, your gallons per minute, and over here, just a quick visual. Was it clear? Were there particles? Was it yellow, brown, red, black? Your initial chlorine residual and your initial turbidity reading, and then your final as well. Uh, there's also a comment section down here where you could put notes, you know, to turn into someone where, you know, packing, leaking on valves, X, Y, Z. And just to help keep the notes. Items I would say to be aware of, reduced pressure situations will result. I kind of went over this already. You know, anyone with a service fed off of this line here is only getting water that's getting past your hydrant during this flush. So they're going to see a drop in pressure. You might have someone come out and say, hey, my pressure is low. What's going on? 
uh, be aware of that. And there are ways to mitigate that. Um, we made some adjustments that we learned in 14 for 2015, where it might be hard to see, but there's a little yellow circle here. That's a valve that isn't being turned, but it's a valve. We could close that valve, you know, and open one further back this way to keep this block in feed. We could have closed this valve here and then open this valve. That way, this stretch of feedy could have been fed off of Lincoln Street and they wouldn't have any water pressure issues. It is extra valves to turn. So if we didn't do that in this situation, but if you have a water sensitive customer here, you might want to do that. So that's where crew experience comes in. You know, if they've been at your t utility a while and are familiar with customers with issues, that comes into play. Another thing to think of is storm sewer capacity. If you have um, poorly draining storm sewer, you might be flooding roads out. So plan ahead for traffic control. Debris and yard waste I talked about earlier with leaf pickup. Flooding private property. You know, if you have a more rural section of town where it's ditches or like us along, we have the Bay of Green Bay by us, and there's a lot of hills that obviously slope to the bay. You might be draining onto private property through people's yards, so plan ahead. Um, traffic, arterial streets, you don't want to be flooding out your busiest street in town at 7 a.m. during rush hour. Um, that being said, the way to prevent that is that's where your crew leader should be looking ahead. Hey, we're going to end the day on this flush, so tomorrow we can start on this flush before rush hour. Um, you know, plan accordingly kind of thing. School zones, in the first year, it never failed. It seemed like every hydrant we had to flush out of was right next to a school by a crossing guard. So we looked at that in 2015 and had a ECOM, re, or not redesigned, but when they designed their sequences, look where the schools were and try to use a hydrant that wasn't right next to a school. It was just something we caught and it helped. Uh, pedestrians, children, gets back to the school thing. Obstructed valves, depending on what city you're in, where you're at. We have one valve that got us in 14 and again in 17. That's right by the courthouse here in town. Um, we go to turn the valve and there's a car parked on it and the person was in jail. <laughs> so we had to redo our sequence a little bit and ad lib and close other valves to make up for that valve to create our dead end. So if you have an area, I guess what I'm saying, and there's a parking lane, put some cones on your valve so people don't park in those stalls or you know, put a hood over the meter or something. That's part of planning ahead. Be ready to answer questions. Why are you doing this? Heard all these a million times. How long before the water is safe again? Explain to them it is safe. You know, it, you might have a little bit of discoloration in it, but I wouldn't suspect a whole lot. Will my laundry turn red now? Be ready to answer that. And then people, of course, think you're wasting the water and this is costing them money out of their pocket. Explain to them why it's not. Can I play in the water? Well, that's up to you, but you'll have a gazillion kids in the summer that want to run through a hydrant blasting 1,200 gallons per minute out of it. I wouldn't let them do that if I were you, but that's your call. Uh, do we actually drink this? I got that question a few times, and I think I have a video coming up here. Or I might have missed it. That'll show some uh, tubercular, some really discolored water that's from the main. Why are you wasting so much water? That came up a lot in 2014 with the drought in California. I had one lady numerous times stopped by me and yelled. She wasn't joking. She was literally pissed because she wanted us to bottle that water and haul it to California. All right, I didn't miss it. So items removed during flushing. This is just an example of a chunk of tuberculation. Um, in our diffusers, you can't see it in here very well. So it's on the other end of the diffuser, but there's like a, a plate in there, you know, that those chunks of tuberculation would hit and break against. Uh, we did have a rock, how that got in our water main, I have no clue. Obviously, it was probably during construction or a water break. But that took a hydrant flowing at about 1,500 gallons a minute down to about 100 gallons a minute in a split second. The ground shook. <laughs> it sounded like uh, there was an accident by me. It was loud. That's what bent this pedo tube. Uh, we got some old wood spiles that actually came out from years gone by. We actually had to put a few hydrants out of service because kids or someone over time took caps off and jammed sticks and everything down in the dang hydrant. So we literally had to take that hydrant out of service, take it apart, get it, get it back working again. Here's one of the videos just to show you what you're going to come across. This was 9th Street, a 12-inch main in Green Bay. No, this is Dalton. I take that back. It's a main in Green Bay that for some odd reason we just had a lot of 
sediment in it. We came across a couple of them like this, or just iron deposits over the years. So of course, people looking at this, they stop, they stare, they yell, is that really our drinking water? So just be ready, you don't know what you're gonna see. Hopefully you can see this video here. You'll see little, if you can see it on your screen, little black looks like pepper coming out in that stream. You can see it out in the road here. That's just chunks of tuberculation. There's, that's what you're after. You're trying to get that out of your water main. And again, it doesn't take a whole lot to make the water look terrible. So keep that in mind as you're trying to explain things to residents. I'm wrapping up here quickly, but what were your results? And this will depend on what you're trying to accomplish with what you're setting up. One thing we did was after we were done, we had set up Kellogg's which is essentially this little contraption. It goes in a hydrant. You load the hydrant. It re takes a reading every, I don't know what, Brian, second, every five seconds. Yeah, you can set them up for okay. different times. It takes a, a pressure reading, and then it records them. And after a week or so, you pull it off and you download it. And then the uh, AECOM would then use that information to see if we improved pressures in any parts of town. Our results, um, we had done some math. I didn't do these, I don't think AECOM ran this, but we saw actually about an average, an increase in our C factor. And you can see down here, and how we determined this was after flushing was done, we did more flushing without closing valves. On hydrants we had done prior to UDF, we then set back on those hydrants, opened the hydrant up, and got you know new readings of how many gallons per minute came out. Um, to determine before and after essentially at that same hydrant what our results were. And we did see an increase. Some of them were a little more dramatic than others. Some, you know, like this one, it actually probably went down a little bit. Who knows what caused that, but we did see an overall increase. And we were able to verify our system model. You know, uh, it was pretty, pretty accurate, I would say, overall. And here's some other interesting results. 2014 in our John Street pressure zone, the average flush really didn't go down, to be honest, in the, from year one to our second go around. Our average gallons per minute did go down a bit, but this is the bigger one. Initial turbidity was almost cut in half. So this is, a, to me, a good indicator of a system that's never been flushed in year 2014 to a system that's been flushed once before. Um, by initial turbidity, what we would do you don't want to start the hydrant and take the first drip of water that comes out. You know, let that hydrant leak get cleaned out. Let the scouring effect start. You know, wait 30 seconds or so and then take your sample and uh, try to be consistent with that, you know, so you can look year to year. But so that was cut in half. Our seven street pressure zone we did in 2015 and then again in 2017, you know, another minimal reduction in duration in gallons per minute. But the average turbidity was almost cut in half again. In John Street Zone in 2014, we had three flushes that literally were over a thousand for initial turbidity, which would have been like that video I just showed a few minutes ago. 14 of the flushes we did were over 500 for turbidity initially. In 2017, only three were over 200. There was that significant of a improvement of uh, what we got out from you know never being flushed to being flushed three years previous. Similar results in the 7th Street zone. In 2015, we had 14 that were over 100 NTU. In 2017, only three. So it, uh, we saw a big difference, you know, in, as far as sediment and tuberculation went from round one to round two. We definitely got a lot out the first time around and seen an improvement in year two. So, any questions? I guess if I can add one quick thing before you guys answer any or ask any questions is we uh, started out in 2014 working a regular uh, five days a week, eight hours a day. And I think Justin alluded to as we got closer to the end, we uh, changed some hours to get more done. So in year two, we switched it up and we went to uh, working four tens and we actually got a lot more production doing the four tens as opposed to the five eights just from the, uh, the tear down and the extra time it takes to set up and turn the valve. So we, we actually got a lot more footage a day flushing when we went to the 410. So I guess with that being said, I guess if you guys have any questions, fire away. I had a question. All right. 
I have heard before that you don't flush larger pipes, mainly like you said, the five hydrants for a 24 inch. Did you guys do your 36s and the and the larger size, or where did you stop? Yep, that is correct. We uh, we, uh, we did um, close to 440 miles of uh, distribution, main. But you're correct. We did not flush okay. our uh, our 36s at our transmission main. So we had about 70 miles of main that we did not do that were considered our transmission main. But we we flushed up through 24, and I want to say there were some that were more distribution type. Just it wasn't necessarily at a size, but you're right. It, the transmission mains we did not unidirectional you know, flush. A lot of them they don't even have hydrants on to flush them. But if they were part of our distribution system and they were 24 and 30 inch those got flushed if they were actually part of the uh what you'd consider a distribution type main but you're right the 36 inch mains we did not do anything with those correct me if i'm wrong but there's planning going on as to how to best clean a transmission line in green bay right yep abigail you're, you're correct we uh we pigged our 36s back in the early 90s because we were having some uh, some C-factor issues and some issues of getting flow into town. So in lieu of unidirectional flushing, obviously we, we pigged them in the early 90s and we've monitored over the years and we've run C-factor tests on them and they stayed pretty steady because we changed our, uh, we were using an alum as a coagulant at the filter plant. And after we pigged in the early 90s, we switched our coagulant. We haven't had any issues with our finished 36s since then. But yeah, that's a good point on, on those larger mains like that. Yeah, it may be where you pig them or you do some other type scenarios instead of unidirectional flushing. You say you don't use alum anymore? That's correct. What are you using? You're using a, a, a PAC, so there is aluminum in it. And uh, based on the monitoring data, there there was aluminum precipitate in the pipes and affecting the the release of lead and copper. It was not as severe as other systems that use alum. I, I have a question about um, if there's any kind of uh, equation, being that uh, the exit uh, hydrant is more or less a four and a half inch. Pipe, uh, pumper nozzle if you're going off a six or an eight or a 10 or a 12 or a 16 inch line how many hydrants would you need to have open to get the scour velocity to give you the adequate cleaning the pipe needs sure um i'll go back here to let's say this worksheet if you look at the worksheet here um right on this flush for instance they have one hydrant is all that's required to clean it shows up here your pipe diameters you're scouring on this particular flush. Yes. In this instance, it's predominantly a six inch where a, a one hydrant is plenty to flush a six. Let's say this is a 12 inch main. It's two to three hydrants, depending on the length of the main you're trying to scour, how many gallons per minute you need to get through it to achieve the five foot per second. So that's part of the design process that your consultant will have to come up with. There's no golden rule where two 12 inch main requires two hydrants. Uh, 16 requires three hydrants. There's no golden rule. It's, it's okay. several factors that come into play. Well, I was just going to say, plus you don't know if you got a main, you don't know where the crossovers are going from a 16 to your 8, if you can use an 8, because in some of our systems, we could go three blocks on the 16-inch before there's a hydrant attached to it, so that kind of makes makes the problem getting the scouring velocity needed to clean the right. pipe a little bit kind of iffy. Yep, yeah, exactly. The longer you're trying to flush, yeah, the more hydrants you're going to have to have to use. That's what we know, like on our river crossings, because obviously they're much longer in length. You'd have several thousand feet you're trying to, to flush at once. So hence, sometimes the four or five hydrants that you have to use. But uh, on our on average, our flushes were about a little over a thousand feet is what we were flushing on average. I would say out of you know the 2,200 flushes, easily. 1,800 to 2,000 of those are single hydrant flushes. An eight-inch main is a sing single hydrant flush. Uh, anything above that might require two hydrants. It all depends on, again, the length and what type of pipe it is, your C-factor that's figured in for that stretch. If there's no other questions right now, I wanted to have Robert tell us about his experiences. Before this session started, he was telling me about 
how he had to deal with valves that had not uh, been through a, a routine maintenance program for years before he got started. Are there any other questions first? I know one question you want us to cover was cost. Yeah, yeah. It Do you depend, have depends on your setup, I guess. Like I said earlier in this thing, our typical day was a 40-hour work week, put it that way, with two employees, sometimes three. So depending on what, you know, your rates are, benefits, that determines things, you know, what, what it costs you to produce a gallon of water. There's really no good way for us, I guess, to quantify and tell you an exact price. Yeah. Kind of depends on on each setup. So. Yeah, and just to remember, but the, the vast majority of our flushes were with, with a two-man crew. Right. You know, the vast majority. So you were using your, your regular employees, right? Not part-time, seasonal, or anything like that? That is correct. The first year we had, we actually had Justin out in the field with one of our uh, distribution maintenance crew guys, one or two of them. And then this past year we had two guys right off of our distribution crews and Justin kind of ran it from in the office here, kind of coordinating everything, but wasn't out in the field, but it it was with our own distribution maintenance crews, not summer help, not uh, seasonal. The only time we used summer help was if we needed like a third or fourth body. Sometimes we would call summer help over to watch like a static gauge or something along those lines. Or if they're, they were really handy, they would make come and turn some valves, stuff like that. It, they didn't turn valves. They uh, would operate a hydrant, so we let them, you know, run a hydrant or something. But, yeah, it was our full-time employees that did uh, 99.9% of this. Did you hire new people to help out on this, or something else was lacking, or what? Not necessarily due to this, but with our lead service replacement program, we did beef up staff a little bit this year, knowing we'd be taking some bodies from those crews to work on flushing. In 14 and 15, we didn't hire anyone else to do it. We, at that time, we kind of thought it, it was going to be a one-time gig, so we tried to just get through. And then after more testing and research and looking at the results, we realized we needed to do this on a more continual basis, at least in the, the shorter duration. So with that being said, and we made the five-year commitment to get all the lead out, we did hire an additional three distribution crew to uh, get the lead out and with the UDF in the combination of the two. So we How hired many lead services do you guys have? We are down to 1,062 of them at oh, the wow. end of September. We started at uh, almost 1,800 at the beginning of 16, and we've gotten over 700 of them out in the last two years with our own crews. Great. How did you handle the other routine needs while – the, such, uh, the regular employees who are out doing the flushing? One way we did it, um, as far as like our, valve turning, our valve turning program, we have an individual that's his job is to exercise our valves and hydrants. He was one of the guys in 14 and 15 that helped with unidirectional flushing because we could report those as operated valves and hydrants. Mm-hmm. So instead of having him do that, you know, like his normal daily gig, he actually helped with this because it was still accomplishing the same goal. Otherwise, we just took, a, we have guys we have on what we call miscellaneous work, doing odds and ends. Um, we would kind of steal f- from that pool of staff to help with the unidirectional flushing so we could still keep our crews intact. Yeah, I mean, we obviously kept doing them whenever we had a broken main. We're fixing that type of emergencies. Uh, there may have been a few wish list items that we may have uh, pushed off a little bit on a more routine maintenance. But uh, that's how we limped through the first two years, you want to say. And then uh, this past year, we did hire three new guys at the beginning of 17 to help with this process. So one more follow-up on that. How many uh, distribution employees do you guys have? We have uh, 17 outside distribution crew guys. We have, uh, yep, basically 17. I said that's a kind of, one of those is our warehouse guy, our, our locators. Uh, maintenance guys at six weeks, uh, that kind, but 17 total in that area. That includes supervisors? Oh, no, that includes just the uh, the actual physical workers that are going out, locating, fixing broken mains, uh, flushing, that kind of stuff. Okay, and then you probably got three or four supervisors with them? 
Yep, yep. There's a couple of supervisors in that in that area that that are aren't part of the seven team. Robert, can you tell us about your experiences with valves that had not been maintained and what you had to do sure. and some of the issues you found with working with them? Sure. Um, I kind of inherited the gate turning and the hydrant turning about seven years ago, and the system before that was always like handed off one year one person would do it, another it was almost like a punishment that somebody got and that was their job to do so by the time i got it it was um pretty neglected you know pencil whip forms were just being filled out nothing was being done gates were being paved over never exercise and marked as being done so the whole isolation process wouldn't even been able to be done unless uh you know until like six years later until i actually got all the gates actually opened vacuumed out exercised because there were some gates 15 16 inch gates that when i first started exercise um they were impossible to turn unless you put like a seven foot sign pole on it to turn the key it was like 500 pounds of torque on it so that started out got 30 turns worked out finally got you know to where it should be like 47 turns 48 turns after about five years of exercising it when i had some spare time so those are finally working right and you also got the effect that there's debris in the bottom uh, that's hard to get out. Some of the boxes have been hit by pavers that are broken. And you don't know any of this until you go out and do the exercising the first time. And the other, another problem is that I found I've had at least 30 to 40 circumstances over the size of the village where gates are actually in the off position and nobody knew about it because somebody would do a water leak over here. One person would be responsible for turning this gate on down here. And, then, and the other ones just got neglected and you don't find out about it until you go through the exercising process uh, of the year. We try to do the whole village every, uh, every two years we get it done. And, and there's even some where the person who was exercising didn't know which way was on. So he would just leave it in the halfway open position. So then we're, we're kind of stuck here. We had a changeover somewhere around 1990 where we went from right hand turn on which was the old gates to left hand turn on which is the newer gates so we got a hodgepodge of all sorts of stuff here and if you got people just coming in as temporaries or summer help and stuff like that they don't know what the hell they're doing you'll end up with what we had i would uh i would agree with you uh, during the unidirectional flushing program you will discover if a valve is accidentally closed yep the, you will have no water coming and yeah it rears its head quickly so yeah, I mean, it, it does happen on water main breaks. A valve accidentally gets shut, and that's and over time. That's why we kind of went to the. We do that all the time now with our crews. Is anything that's closed, they paint pink. In case so we to this day we will have someone drive down the road and come in and say, hey, that valve is pink. So we'll go out there and open it up. We ju we actually just started doing that a system kind of like with your pink blue system but we had a little bit different one but you're, that, it's more or less the same thing you're doing just with a different system we just use a line a blue line instead of a blue circle if it's got a blue line yeah. through that means it's uh closed and when you paint it blue in the circle then then it's open there you go yeah whatever works but you're you're right we uh it's all similar up till the early 2000s our crews we would operate bells and hydrants by trying to uh, on when our crews had downtime or, or just trying to fit it in. And like I said, yeah. it never really fit in real well, you know? So then in the early 2000s, we hired a full-time Bell's Turner hydrant operator, and that's solely that person's position to do. So in the last 15 years, this person's been doing that all the time. Obviously, in the summer, it's more of the hydrants, and then in, through the colder months, it's the, the valve turning. But yep. most Same of our here. valves have probably been gotten to at least you know three, four times since we've hired them. So every valve had been operated, every hydrant numerous times has been operated. One other thing that is important right now that I've been finding out over the last year is getting the right piece of equipment to turn the gates because um, I just, my boss handed down, um, he wanted us to start exercising the hydrant gates, going to the hydrant and during the flushing process. And if you're just doing them by hand or with one of those things, you, uh, a hydraulic one that you stand there and use, you can't turn them with the hydrant gushing out because most of the time the gate's right in front of the, the main where the water's coming out. So we got a gate turner where you can operate it uh, uh, remotely and turn the gate for the hydrant when it's flushing. So that helps clean that gate out too and keeps that system clean. Robert, you also talked about that possibly a, a system where there's a, a section where the, there has not been maintenance of the valves and hydrants uh, that possibly they need to spend uh, year number one just 
exercising the valves and hydrants and taking care of those problems before starting a unidirectional flushing program. For sure. Before that, I actually started uh, turning the gates. And if I want to have these gates located, because some of them were buried, some of them uh, were filled with broken box chunks. Um, some of the boxes were all set. If you don't have a visual, uh, uh, an, uh, an idea in your head of where the stuff is, if it's functional, all other kind of stuff, you're going to spend at least a year before you can do the unidirectional flush because some of them actually have to be dug up and the box is offset and you can't get onto that. You, you have to dig it up. You just can't vacuum that out and clean it. And then some of them are paved over and yeah, it's, you actually have to be before you start doing unidirectional flush on a system. I had to be a year ahead of it because I didn't know what I had and what worked. So if you don't know what works, you can't do anything. You don't get the, you don't get it shut down. Right. Can valves be exercised during the winter? Yes. Oh, yeah. So yep, that that's what be... we do all winter. Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously, you can't d work on the hydrants during the winter, but um, but a person could get a good head start. At, like, they could start now and, and start getting ready for the next cleaning season. One problem with doing it in the winter is um, if, they, if they're not properly cleaned out and they got mud in them, frozen mud, frozen mud's hard to get out. Then you need the hydro excavator and all that other kind of stuff to get that out. But yeah, the frozen mud part's a problem if you don't have it already cleaned out. That's a, the really the only winter problem I, I can say. You also talked about in doing unidirectional flushing where the valve was not completely closed, basically. it could you, you hadn't gotten to that point where you could completely close it there was problems with debris going into the feeder lines and complaints from customers. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, yeah, we had problem issues with the larger size gates that had been exercised and who knows, you know, it could have been 50 years. And when I found one of those, um, the first instance I did it, um, yeah, there were phone calls to Village Hall about cloudy water. And then after that, I learned if I find one of these, that just like mashes down and doesn't get the turns that it should. You should always be running a hydrant. You need to have one next where the closest one where you can get it clean, have that hydrant running when you turn it. So when you crush in all that debris that's in the bottom of the gate, it's got to go somewhere and you don't want to go into their houses. So you can have that hydrant running. It works. And the one gate that I finally got into the amount of turns it should have actually took almost about two and a half years before I got that thing turning the amount that it should have been. And every time I got two more turns, it, it always surprised me. I'm like, holy crap, it just keeps getting more turns more turns every time finally it hit 48 and i'm like you know it's just unbelievable how many turns you're missing from those things when they're not turned for 40 or 50 years and the final thing we had talked about was um keeping a, a documentation on the history of what's being done to each valve like uh, using the gis system to do that yeah that was set up because before part of the, the one of the main problems was everything was done on paperwork and a clipboard would just be handed from one person to the next person every spring. And you just look at what the person had. And that didn't take into account that any of the gates were replaced. So, I mean, you're making the same check mark, the same piece of paper that has been circulated for the last 30 years. So the GIS system, you actually got to put your name down, how many turns you take, what direction it is, the torque that it has. And it's, it's almost like, I, I think it's great to have it but it's, it keeps you honest about what you're doing because if something's screwed up, your name's right on it. So, yeah, it, 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 you record any comments um, about if there's a problem or, you know, I better get there before school starts because the bus park's on top of it. You can make any of those comments in the comment section. It's got an inspection section. Without that, and oh, and you can do it for, right from your truck, too, and from, from your truck, your boss can see it, the engineering department can see it, anybody who needs that information has instant access to it. And all it, um, it also has, uh, it, like if I do half of the village, that t turns blue and the other half of the gates are red. It, it, it just keeps everything up to date and knowing where you should go and where everything is and what you've done. It's real. It's a godsend, really. You know, I'm, I'm always advocating that um, the water mains get cleaned with unidirectional flushing. The data that I have from water systems all over, not over, only Wisconsin, but also in other states, is that our water quality is tied to the cleanliness of our of our water pipes. And a big difference with unidirectional flushing is that we're getting such a high velocity, we're actually getting debris scoured off that that has not been scoured off uh, in standard flushing. 
an example of that is we were seeing remnants of the well water use in Green Bay. They hadn't used the well since 1957. So that's a pretty profound statement as to how debris stays around a water system unless it's really, really scoured out. And it's very important to try to get to that less than one NTU turbidity goal. I've got lots of data that ties uh, water quality issues, uh, especially the transport of lead and copper around the system when the turbidity is high. So um, if you go and get and do standard flushing, the turbidity can be quite high uh, when one ends, when the water meets the white bucket test, the turbidity can still be over 50 or over 100. And that is actually causing a temporary water quality problem. In the, with one of my monitoring stations, I measured the effect of standard flushing. It took three months for the iron particulates to settle down. And every time the iron particulates came into my lead test chamber, I got high lead particulate because the iron picks up the lead and transports it. Every bit of turbidity that's left over means a potential health hazard and water quality issue in the distribution system, even though it may be a temporary one. Just to tell you guys, when uh, before we unidirectional flushed, uh, some of our lead and copper sample sites, we had readings of over 400 uh, on lead, on particulate. And then after we UDF, the highest we were seeing was in the 30s, you know, which still was above the 15, but we came back under the action limit and we weren't seeing those in the hundreds anymore like we were prior to UDFing. Yeah, exactly. And and I'm a big advocate for uh accumulating data on everything one does, including these flushing runs. And just like uh, Justin and Brian talked about taking the beginning turbidity, the ending turbidity, and the time to get to the ending turbidity. And what that does is helps you plan the next year's flushing. The first time that you go out and do the flushing, it is a lot of resources that are used, um, both labor and expenses. But over time, it becomes optimized. And with this data, you can tell how often you actually do need to clean certain areas of the city. So uh, I think Green Bay's done a fantastic jo job of going even beyond this to even have data about the hydraulic improvements and so forth. That's one of the, the big advances of how to flush water systems is to take measurements and reach certain goals with turbidity and to optimize the your efforts with the data just like Green Bay has. I know that the objective here is to reduce lead levels in our systems. Can you just briefly if possible explain how or the actual you know we understand that the lead is in our service laterals and you have spoken to how the iron carries the lead. Are you at all suggesting that the lead is in, in the water mains within that tuberculation, or can you touch on that at all, please? Typically, there is not much, if any, lead out in the water mains. Iron, manganese, and aluminum especially, out in the water mains, end up as particulates entrained in the water, flowing into buildings and settling out there. That's where they come in contact with components that do have lead. I'm talking even minute quantities of lead can build up in-premise plumbing over time because of the settling out of these various other metal particulates. Obviously, you're not cleaning the premise plumbing, but the, the cleaner the water that goes into the premise plumbing, the less problem you have in the premise plumbing. You cut off the source of particulates going into the premise plumbing. Over time, building plumbing flushes out and you're no longer holding all that lead and other metals as well. I have data on that from the Madison Water Utility where uh, I studied 
homes as they were changing out the complete lead services. And that's where I, I found there was something holding lead in the, in the premise plumbing, in the building piping for up to four years after all of the lead service line, the complete lead service line was changed out. It took four years to flush out the debris and the lead particles that were being held in the pipes. And it turns out in Madison, that was manganese particulates. So the same thing goes on with uh, iron particulates and aluminum. If you can clean up your water mains, you're not sending more particulates in there to, to hold on to metals. Another part of that is a whole microbiological part, which we haven't talked about today. But by cleaning the water mains, you're also getting rid of a buildup of biofilms and microorganisms. All of that material can also go into homes that corrodes metals. You're, you're taking care of both the cleanliness and the biostability of the water by cleaning the water mains. And the buildings benefit from that. Really appreciate Justin and Brian giving their experiences. You guys did a, a great job. It's a great example. So thank you so much for giving us that presentation. <laughs>